I'm here today with Frank Klepacki, who's composed game soundtracks for some of the biggest publishers in the video game industry, including Westwood Studios, LucasArts, Electronic Arts, Sega, Ubisoft, Disney, SSI, Hasbro, and Virgin Interactive. And he's also the recipient of the PC Game Magazine's Best Game Soundtrack for Command & Conquer Red Alert. Between 2008 and 2011, Frank was also the touring drummer for The Family Stone, which featured Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees and members of Sly and the Family Stone, saxman Jerry Martini and trumpeter Cynthia Robinson. In addition, Frank's music has been featured on several cable TV shows as well as on ABC TV, including America's Got Talent, Top Gear, America's Most Wanted, Pawn Stars, and a ton more. Since 2004, Frank has served as the audio director for Petroglyph Games, the developer for Star Wars Empire at War, as composer and sound designer for a, a wide variety of game genres featuring a wide range of compositional styles. One of the podcast listeners wanted to know that for Dune 2 and for the Carandia series mm -hmm. and for other computer games of the era that you worked on, which sound card device did you start with when you were creating a musical piece? And then what was your workflow? How, how yeah, you um, so I remember in Dune 2, that was all done on the ad lib card uh, with, with Visual Composer first. And that was this native uh, uh, native format. Then um, it was towards the end of the project that we decided to uh, you know uh, start supporting MT32. Oh, really? The Roland, yeah. So we incorporated that. Um, and, and and that's when you switched over to Cakewalk. Uh, was... Well, no, no. I still was using uh, Visual Composer. Oh, uh, really? And just and just rerouted the MIDI, you know, through through the MT32. Having never used it, I, I didn't know that it supported other devices other than the other. Yeah, you just had to have the MIDI card. <laughs> sure. So we had to have a special Roland MIDI card in the computer, and then it would, you know, reroute it that way. Um, and then, uh, then I, I think when I did Kyrandia, I actually did that on the MT32 first, and then translated it backward to the, to the AdLib card, Sound Blaster cards. And then on games going forward, is that, was that your workflow? You started on the MT32 first and worked backwards? Or? Well, it's kind of interesting because it wasn't long that I was was doing that. You know, like like I said before, how technology changed so rapidly. You know, by the time by the time we wrapped those games, I mean Roland had already come out with the replacement, which was the Sound Canvas, right? And General MIDI. And, and yeah. General MIDI, yeah. and and then uh, you know, but we were off, you know, doing things on the Genesis, and like I said, you know, doing doing the other consoles. Uh, by the time. Um, we were doing some of the other uh, PC titles. I mean, we, you know, we still uh, continue to support that. Some of them got even ported over to the Amiga, like Eye of the Beholder 2 was. And, um, and uh, you know, it was, um, you're always adjusting it to the format of the system. And um, so I'm, on a, I'm trying to think of, uh, we got, we still used the MT32 slash Sound Canvas uh, for Kyrandia 2. Um, the follow-up to to the first Kyrandia, and then we switched to all audio streaming uh, for Kyrandia three. Hmm. Um, I think even by the time we got to uh, well, actually, yeah, when we got when we did Monopoly as well in in ninety five, that was still utilizing the the old MIDI technology as well. So uh, so yeah, we I think I think ninety five was the the switch over year, and then, then everything <laughs> went streaming. Sure, uh, you mentioned the Amiga um, and. Uh, Amiga uses tracker music or mod files. Um, did you use the mod file format in any of your games? You know, I didn't focus too much on it, to be honest. I, uh, I, act, I, you know, we did use it for the sampled playback instruments. In fact, I think the Amiga was probably the first system to, to really start offering that. Um, so it was nice to hear that, you know, as, as part of, you know, what that system did versus having to use an external MIDI module like in Roland MT32. Right. Uh, so, um, so we we just used it to uh, to play back the the proper instruments that we wanted to assign to to all of the tracks, but um, I didn't use it as intensively as uh, some of the you know guys who who really dove into the mod tracker stuff did. I mean, I recall a lot of that being used uh, you know for for actually triggering loops and and chunks of samples even to kind of you know, uh, help fill out the scores even that much more. Probably the closest uh, example of that that we did 
was when we did Command and Conquer and it had to be ported over to the N64 system. Mm-hmm. Um, we had sent, uh, we had full on uh, Red Book audio, you know, and, and wave file playback capability for for the all the other systems, you know, the Sega Saturn and the PlayStation and and all of that. But uh, the N64 was still a cartridge based system and did not quite have uh, as much space on the cartridge to support that. So mm-hmm. we had to break everything up into segments and chunks and kind of rework the scores that way and we had some help uh, from the programming team on that and the people that that helped us to develop that out um so that was really cool but yeah that was really the only uh examples of, of any kind of mod tracker work that that we had done uh you know we we rapidly just kind of went for the the streaming you know at that point uh do you remember what software you used on the amiga just curious uh well, um, yeah, it was you know it was the same the same program, the Doctor T's that oh, we used. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, so you've got about fifty games to your credit, and uh, you've scored a number. I uh, scored uh, a lot of games, and you performed on all the soundtracks. And I, I guess most people don't realize that not only are you scoring, but you're also performing all the instruments. So you kind of have to keep in mind how an instrument is played where it doesn't sound like a keyboard actually generating the tone that you try to make it sound like a violin solo, you know, and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I'd like you to give us a, a brief rundown of, of the major titles that you worked on and talk about some of your memories from that period. Sure. Or your um, career. Well, I remember, it's it's funny, uh, you mentioned uh, Kyrandia, and the first Kyrandia that we did, um, I was recently talking about this a bit with a with a press interview we did at Gamescom with uh, Mike Legg, who was uh, you know president of Petroglyph, but he was also the lead programmer and and uh, designer on Kyrandia. Um, he uh, we were both talking and reminiscing about it because somebody like actually popped it open on their laptop right in front of us and <laughs> said, "Hey, can you tell us you know what you remember about working on this?" And you know start start walking through wow. you know, some of the things and. Not and everybody walks around with a Kyrandia I know. on their laptop. <laughs> I know it was it was it was kind of a trip, but it was a, a delightful you know surprise, and uh, we just started reminiscing about it. And one thing that you know immediately, of course, comes to mind is the artist Rick Parks, who worked on uh, you know the, all the art. He uh, he was uh, you know one of Westwood's most beloved artists and and super talented guy, uh, really sweet guy. And you know we lost him you know to leukemia, oh. you know years later, but. Um, you know, we always remembered him, and and uh, he left a very very large you know mark on the art world and the video game world, and that was you know such a beautifully done game for that time period. You know, the art yeah. style was awesome, and he you know it, it just brought us right back to to you know his amazing contribution to that. Um, but then you know talking about like the music part of it, I remember scoring all the different scenes. You know, you'd walk into a different scene, and then the music would change. Um, it didn't really uh, uh, change in the sense of some of the other titles, like like the IMU system that Lucas Arts used, you know, for the Monkey Island games and stuff. I mean, right. we loved those games. We thought they were brilliantly executed, and uh, so you know, we tried to, you know, I tried to similarly, like, you know, capture some some feel of of, of that, but um, I did it more with a, a new age music style that was kind of the popular thing at the time, and. Uh, and you know, it was just nice to utilize that Roland MT32 and get those nice synth instruments and get that ethereal feeling out of it at least um, for the time era. And uh, and I had a I had a blast score in that game. It was um, it was just very atmospheric, and I think that was the key is is to make you feel like you're in that world as much as sure. as possible uh, because you know a lot of magical things would happen and you know all of the events that you would trigger that you know. Uh, you know, would have a nice little effect, you know, and it just felt very magical, you know, and it was whimsical and and, and, uh, and it was fun. Um, Dune 2, of course, was, uh, you know, first real-time strategy game. And so, you know, working on that was definitely a special, special thing. And I remember just <laughs> working that visual composer program to its <laughs> core. I mean, I put that, I programmed so many you know, detailed uh, tempo changes and instrument changes on the fly and, and uh, volume changes and just, I mean, if you looked at the, the top row where, all, where you could insert all the, pro- it just looked like, you know, a constant black line because there was so much there. Program every, changes. Every other yeah. note. I mean, because I, limit, limitation-wise, you had, uh, there was nine channels that the cards could support and six of those were reserved for music and the other three were for sound effects. Yeah. So I had, uh, you know, six... Uh, 
you know, six mono FM synth generated instruments that could play at any one time. Sure. So I was, you know, using a few of them to create chords while, you know, one was doing a melody and then I would, the next bar, I would switch it to the next thing that was going to make another chord, you know, and then hold one note while the other two changed and, you know, constantly uh, changing it up to keep it interesting with now, the limitations of the amount of channels. When you say channels, you're talking about polyphony, right? It had six Polyphony, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So, yeah, I mean, it was... Um, yeah, six, yeah, six different uh, mono, you know, polyphony channels. So, um, yeah, changing it up on, on on a regular basis for all of the songs that are in that game is just you know it's a constant thing, and uh, you know, but it 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 helped with um, keeping the player feeling like there was always something adapting to what they were doing, even though it really wasn't. <laughs> it was kind of a little trick. Yeah. Uh, you know, we would have little transitional pieces that would go from the uh, the ambient music to the battle music, you know, and because it was, you know, FM synthesis and it's, you know, always being triggered and, and allowed for the last thing to end, you know, it, it was very seamless. Sure. And uh, so that worked to our advantage in that way. Um, so that was, that was kind of a fun little uh, uh, technical <laughs> aspect of working on that. On Dune 2, did you take any inspiration from the movie score? A bit, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed the movie. Although um, I was also, I had also enjoyed the other Dune game that came out around the same period, which was, you know, it wasn't called Dune 1, but it was essentially Dune 1, and it was uh, the, uh, um, I think it was Creo, Creo that made that. Okay. Um, um, they, uh, I remember listening to the, the guy that did the soundtrack for that, and, th and I thought it was really cool, too. So I was like, all right, well, you know, maybe I'll, you know, blend a little bit of uh, you know that kind of style with the movies, you know, and and okay. and do my own thing with it. And it was so. Dude, the Dune Two soundtrack was sort of a hybrid of, of creativity of, of all of those influences, and and, okay. and I just kind of did my thing with it. Other games that uh, are worth reminiscing over? Yeah, uh, well, I the Beholder Two, you know, uh, awesome game. Dungeons and Dragons, you know, I mean, who doesn't love that sure, <laughs> as yeah. a gamer? And uh, you know, I really loved playing that game. I mean, it really immersed me into the the story and and you know that whole dungeon crawl thing was really cool. And uh, but I remember about that game. I remember trying to score it kind of sparsely. I didn't want to always have music playing all the time. I right. uh, wanted some of the just the atmosphere of walking around and hearing some of the sound effects and stuff and, you know, being being in those uh, uh, different mazes that you go through. wanted to let that breathe, you know, and then the music would play more for special events or things that popped up or characters that you encountered, you know, things like that. So, um, so it was used more in that way. And, of course, you know, we had little, you know, transitional scenes. You know, they had the full-on intro, you know, it was sure. animated and... and uh, some of those things that required, you know, a little bit more scoring, and that was uh, that was that was uh, a really fun game to work on in that respect. We also did the same thing uh, moving on to Lands of Lore, right? Um, so, uh, you know, we kind I of remember seeing that. that at D three once and going, "Holy crap!" Because <laughs> yeah. I was making adventure games for Interplay at the time, and okay, and I saw that and went, "Ooh, I've got some competition here to think about." <laughs> Yeah, Lands of Lore again gave me that same feeling, you know, that same uh, immersion, and um, and I I did more scoring for that. I, I you know, of course got to use the MT32 again in that in the sound canvas for that, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, got to do more of the medieval style that I really love. Oh, cool! Um, you know, because you know, doing being in high school and playing in all of the the orchestra stuff, you know, some of the classical pieces that they make you compose or compose that they make you perform. The classical pieces they make you perform, I listened to uh, and paid attention to, even though I'm in the back and the drums, you know, <laughs> right, yeah. you know, I'm listening to them separate every section. So, you know, uh, you know, just the French horns play, you know, bar eight through sixteen, and you know, just the flutes play this section, and just the, so, you know, over time, I would just absorb that, and it would occur to me how to bridge all of those instruments together. So then if I started writing something that was more classical in nature or more orchestral in nature, I was like, oh, I remember, you know, how that all fits. So sure, then yeah. I, would, I would be able to, uh, to compose in that way with, with that knowledge in mind. And, and I, I drew from a lot of different influences, uh, that uh, movie soundtracks and stuff that I really enjoyed. One particular that jumps out at me is, is uh, the original, well, not the original, the the Robin Hood that came out with Kevin Costner and Morgan Freeman. Mm -hmm. I loved that movie soundtrack, and that was done by Michael Kamen. And um, it was uh, it was had some had some really nice uh, 
you know adventurous moments, but right. it also had some really nice like bardish moments, you mm -hmm. know, and and uh, I loved that sort of mix, and so I, I took that as a huge influence at the time. Yeah, uh, Michael Kamen is one of my favorites too. Yeah. Uh, then there was the whole Command and Conquer series, and uh, indeed, even, yeah. Go ahead and talk about that. All right, so uh, yeah, Command and Conquer. That was uh, that was just. Uh, for me per personally it was a big experiment <laughs> it was you know and, and it, it may have been across the board for a lot of people too but but for me in particular I just remember us kind of having a kickoff audio meeting about that and when it came to the music and um, it was sort of a powwow between uh, myself uh, the audio director Paul and uh, Brett Sperry the uh, president of Westwood and um, we all sat in Paul's office and just started putting on CDs and tapes which were still a thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Long and, before the iPod. <laughs> right. And we were just, you know, pointing out different examples of music that, you know, would be cool for certain emotions or certain, you know, elements, you know. Hey, just this piece of this song is cool because I like the way this, you know, rhythm is or this instrument that they use here or the way this melody goes or whatever. And so we just kind of put our heads together on that and I sort of made a... a, a my own tape, if you will, of a bunch of these clips, you know, that, that we talked about and pointed wow. out and, and, and songs that, that uh, I, and I wrote down which ones. And, and uh, I just sort of took that and put it into a stew, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and started creating. And, uh, and, and they really emphasized, too, like, hey, you know, even though we talked about all this stuff, like, don't feel like you have to stick to that 100 percent. Just, you know, do what you want to do. Create a bunch of stuff. Let us hear it. And we'll figure out what works and what doesn't. And Great. That was kind of the thing. They very much were nurturing of being creative and doing doing things that were fresh and new. And that was always Brett's go-to line. I want something fresh. You know? <laughs> um, was this the first time you collaborated in that way on the game? Uh, I suppose. I mean, most of the time I was used to kind of just dealing directly with, with Paul or, or uh, getting a suggestion here and there from, from some of the team. But... Uh, but uh, yeah, that was kind of the, the first time we really like did a full like meeting just on music selection mm -hmm. and, and styles. So, uh, so I took that, yeah, like I said, just kind of put it in the stew, just let it, let it sink in for a while and started creating different things. And I was all over the place. I mean, I was drawn from, you know, soundtracks like, you know, to live and die in LA, you know, Blade Runner and, and Natural Born Killers and and uh, you know listening to Nine Inch Nails and and you know heavy metal that I liked you know Metallica or you know uh, White Zombie or <laughs> sure. so different stuff like that and then you know um, and then other other things that were kind of avant garde you know like uh, you know Brett was having me listen to like Laurie Anderson <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> crazy stuff like that too you know so I was like okay well you know this is strange but I'll check it out you know and anime soundtracks you know right um, and then Vince DiCola of course is a huge influence for me he was um, revolutionary you know a synthesizer composer back uh, in the 80s uh, when he did Rocky 4 and, and the original Transformers movie which are you know one of my favorite you know uh, soundtracks so that was also something that was a huge influence on on uh, some of my early work there. Uh, trying to, I tried to fit that into the mix where I could, you know, um, right. amidst everything else. Even hip hop, we were listening. I mean, I was, you know, putting on <laughs> Dr. Dre and stuff, you know, and say, like, okay, how can we do something with this, you know? So you throw all that together, and and you get uh, what came out as Command and Conquer. <laughs> you know, amazing. It was, <laughs> it was it was allowed to be diverse. It was allowed to be creative, and. Um, and it resonated with a, a yeah. whole generation of it gamers. Sure did, you yeah. know, it just we had no idea that it would would uh, be the hit that it was. We knew we had something fun and special because we were addicted to playing it ourselves in the office prior to its release. You know, yeah. I mean, we'd be testing it and we just wouldn't want to leave. We would just you know, let's play another game. You know, I want to <laughs> kick your ass this time. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, without Command and Conquer and ultimately Dune Two, there'd be no you know Starcraft. There'd be you know Age of Empires. Uh, yeah. All those RTSs would never exist. So. Yeah, you know, that really kicked off the genre. So it was uh, it was a fun time. It was it was really like we felt like, you know, we were kind of renegade ragtag, you know, going for it. You know, let's let's make some fun, cool stuff. And it was we just we had so such a blast. You know, it was it was great. You also composed uh, music for one of the games I was a producer on Knox. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, Knox was was, <laughs> and actually Knox was probably one of the biggest challenges uh, for me because of the time in which I was given to compose it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wasn't brought in until the very end of the project. And it was sort of like a last minute, you know, I think everybody had sort of forgotten that it needed a soundtrack up until we were getting ready to having to wrap the game up. And all of a sudden, while I'm amidst working on three other projects and bouncing back and forth, they like throw Knox into my lap and say, Frank, uh, we have this game, Knox. Uh, we need it done in a month, you know, or a month and a half. Or it was something crazy. Like I had a very limited amount of time to score the whole game. And I'm like, I just sat there with my mouth open for a minute and I was like, really? <laughs> Are you kidding? That was my doing. That's I it? That's all that. I get? <laughs> so, um, no, what so. happened there was um, the multiplayer version of that game was pretty much done uh, when Virgin Interactive picked it up. Mm -hmm. And I got there just as the single player stuff was starting. And um, we didn't, I, as I recall, the timing, we didn't start asking for music until we were recording the vocal, the, uh, the spoken lines as well. Right. And um, so, yeah, I do remember the compressed time frame that you were under for that, and it turned out great. I thought it was awesome music. Yeah, a lot of people enjoyed it, you know. Um, I mean, it's one of those projects, though, where I really wish I had a bit more time to work on it because I felt like I could have done a better job than what I did uh, if I was given that, you know, a little bit more... Uh, uh, a little bit more time to work on it. Because there were some really good ideas there, you know, in a lot of those scores that I really wanted to, you know, spend more time to develop. You know, right. I wanted to turn them into, you know, a bit grander themes than they were or, or whatnot. But, you know, I mean, in the end, I mean, I work well under pressure, so I was still able to deliver the content and, uh, and make it work and still make it, you know, reasonable, high quality for the time period. So, you know... What, what, what can you say? It's, uh, it's one of those uh, go for it and hit the ground running, you know? Sure. Um, now, you talked about just now about uh, listening to a bunch of different musical styles. Mm -hmm. um, and then you ended up composing in many of those kind of styles. How did you develop the chops to compose, say, hip hop and then, you know, metal and, and then orchestra? It's a pretty wide range. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things where I... In my head, I guess, I always thought of it as not being that different from each other. Um, for example, like, t let's, let's take the heavy metal example, right? Um, I was a total hard rock, you know, metal guy, you know, from when I was a kid all the way through high school. And at the same time, I just, I, I would see similarities in orchestral and classical music that were used also in those types of music, depending on the band, who, you know, whoever was sure. being creative enough to, because, you know, like take bands like Metallica, for example, uh, they have some classical influence in some of their music. You know, they would have breakdowns where they would get out of this hard thrash metal and all of a sudden they would start playing this really nice, you know, uh, clean guitar, you know, changes that were Bach-like, you know, and... And then I'll, then you would listen. I would listen to a, like Ingve Malmsteen, and this guy is a Paganini fan. You know what I mean? And right. so you listen. He's playing, you know, blistering speeds, but ultimately it's still classical music. You could take that his his compositions and put them in an orchestral setting, and it would work. And and you're not the first one to, men to tell me that yeah. metal is basically orchestra music with just different instruments. Yeah, with distorted guitars. Iron Maiden, another classic example. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, these guys, uh, you know, their music is very accessible. You know, so I mean, it's not. It's not that difficult to learn to play and, you know, just play with precision, but, you know, guitar harmonies are a big thing for them. And, you know, to me, that was no different than, you know, brass and string sections, you know, playing in harmony together. And, sure. And uh, I just I just put the two and two together. Um, being a drummer, you know, I, I'm always rhythm conscious. So I've always paid attention to, you know, any percussive element or, or drum style that is in any song. And then I was a big funk fan as well. So listening to funk music, that is clearly where hip hop comes from. So, yeah. you know, to me, hip hop was, you know, even even more simpler version of, you know, of funk music. You know, just, you just have somebody that's uh, rhyming over the top of it instead of singing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or it's just more about a, a, an attitude or a charisma of, of a certain rapper, you know, and then they would, you know, elect to have a certain type of beat style that, that, that they also associate with. So. You know, it wasn't. Uh, I, I was. I was able to easily piece these things together based on my diverse background, and but also just hearing things that I look for the similarities in. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, as a musician, I uh, and particularly as a composer, I find myself analyzing the music more than 
the vocals because that's that's where my head is and so yeah i know a lot of music but i don't know any of the words <laughs> I, I, that's exact that's exactly my weakness too i can't remember <laughs> lyrics to save my life like i know i've heard songs a hundred times and i could not tell you all the lyrics to them you know i'm <laughs> just yeah. like you know what i can tell you the melody i can tell you what the bass guitar and drums and everything else is doing but i yeah. can't tell I can you, tell you the port, chord progression <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, it's funny because like i find myself anytime i'm in a situation where i need to sing I have to focus extra hard to remember what I'm singing <laughs> for that reason. Uh, in the early days, um, did you have any brushes with fame or anything like that? Did you meet any celebrities or any heroes that you had? Uh, in the early days, I mean, not so much. I would, uh, you know, I'd always go out to concerts. And uh, if there was ever a band that was playing in a smaller venue that I really liked, I would usually have the opportunity of, you know, finding a way to head backstage and, and meet them or something, you know, and just show some appreciation and that sort of thing, get autographs, you know, or whatever. But, um, yeah, um, oddly enough, you know, this is sort of an ironic thing that, I, that I've told to people before too, but which is uh, when the whole Command and Conquer thing blew up, and especially when Red Alert came out, right. uh, the follow-up, that just took on a life of its own. Uh, the popularity just skyrocketed, and, and particularly with the music as well. I remember when we put out the soundtrack CD to the first Command and Conquer. I was just like, "Wow, really? They're gonna they're gonna put out a soundtrack CD?" I'm like, yeah, a lot of people were asking for it. You know, it'd be cool promo promo item. Da da da. I'm like, "All right, well, that's kind of cool." And I just wrote it off as something that maybe only the diehards wanted, or you know what I mean. I didn't think of it as anything that special. Even, you know, I mean, I had fun creating it, and it's great, and it's great if people like it. But right. I didn't view it on par with you know, everything else I was familiar with, you know, like, you know, like the persona of a rock band, you know, that you associate with or right. whatever. Oh, I love that album. I listen all the time. I didn't, I didn't make the association that video game music could have that same impact on anyone. Right. I just didn't think about it that way. Then Red Alert came out and when it blew up in, in such a huge way and I just got so many replies on, oh my God, Hell March is one of the best songs ever, you know, and <laughs> started winning awards for it and all of this stuff. And I'm like, really? I just like, my mind was just blown. I could not believe it, you know, and, and people are now using me in the same sentence with their favorite bands, you know, and I'm like, this is, this is really a trip, <laughs> you know, it was really And now there's a, a Grammy out for that category. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now you, you, uh, you mentioned in a all hands meeting at Petroglyph here, uh, just, just so the podcast listeners know, uh, Frank and I are both employed by Petroglyph Games in Las Vegas, and uh, so this is why we have the chance to talk today uh, about Frank's career. But at a recent um, all-hands meeting, a, a company meeting, you talked about your experience at um, Gamescom in yeah. Germany and how you got to meet some of your fans. Tell us about that. Yeah, so, um, well, I mean, you know, he, going from that, you know, Red Alert, which came out in 96, you know, we're now in 2014, and... Uh, I had never been to Gamescom before. I'd heard about it. I've heard it's huge. I've heard it's massive. I've heard it's tiring. I've heard, <laughs> you know, I've heard, I've heard all sorts of things. And I'm just like, well, you know, how bad can it really be? It's a convention, right? Well, you know, and, and not that it was talked about in, in a bad way. I'm just saying, like, you know, the, the exhaustion that I hear from people about, oh, yeah, I was at Gamescom. Oh, my God, I'm so glad I can relax now. You know, it's like this big event. You know, okay, so it's a huge event. Great. I went for the first time this year and got first-hand taste of it, and they are not kidding. Anyone I've ever heard talk about it is not joking. This place is huge. It's, I think there was, you know, like close to 400,000 people, you wow. know, in this one convention. I mean, that's a city. That's a city's <laughs> worth of people in one convention center. And I've never seen that many people, first of all, in one place ever. And second of all, uh, the amount of awesome enthusiasm from everybody there was just really something to behold um i think in the united states uh just the general audiences here for anything uh whether it's games music movies whatever i think i think we're, it's it's sort of a, an expectation that we always have this art form and people will appreciate it but at the same time maybe take it a little bit for granted that it's always there you sure, know and, yeah. and accessible and and whatever and some people are very passionate about it and i've felt that before too but i really really felt an abundance of it there uh and you could say okay well it's because you know you've got all these gamers gathered in one place so naturally you're going to feel that there but i i would say it's even more so than what i'm used to you know from other game conventions i've been to in the states this one definitely took the cake um and we got so many people that uh kept coming up to us and 
would either recognize us or know who we were based on our past, you know, uh, with at Westwood and games we've done at Petroglyph here, and say, oh my God, you know, Star Wars Empire Wars one of my favorite games, the Universal Wars one of my favorite games. I love the soundtrack to that game. Oh, I was, you know, I wish you guys would do a second one. And you know, and then of course all of the people who grew up with Command and Conquer and and some people, you know, like I said, brought up Kyrandia and Dune and all of those games as well, you know, and. It's just a con- it was it was a constant reminder for that whole five days that we spent at that convention, of gosh, there are still people out there who not only are passionate and love video games, but still are uh, appreciative of the history and appreciative of of what we've done and our contributions. And here it is, years later, we're still talking about it. They're still talking about <laughs> it, you know. And they want to know the stories and they want to know, you know, uh, have have more of a connection with, you know. The behind the scenes and, and ask me directly you know how did you feel when you did this song and that song and you know, what made you think of that and when did you think of it and you know it's just, pretty intense yeah it yeah. is but it but it was just really awesome it's just I mean it's an awesome feeling to know that that people love it that much but at the same time it reminded us why we do what we do again you know it's like we've been doing it this this whole time I mean I've been in the industry now you know 22 years right. and you know, day in, day out, we're used to this environment. We're used to coming into work and cranking out another set of tasks and, and you know, making that next game level work and how we're going to prototype this and meetings on this and, you know, making sure the publisher's happy with the next milestone. And, you know, so that's that's our normal day to day. We don't get to see the the reception of it on a day to day basis, you know, you, until you the had, game ships, you know. Right. And you had people in tears coming up to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, that was that was another mind blowing thing, you know, this. Uh, I had a fan come up to me and he was, you know, I could see his eyes are welling up a little bit, you know, I'm just like, dude, that's cool. I'm, I'm right here. We can chat, you know, however long you want to talk for. He's like, oh, I just didn't think you would be here. I'm so surprised, you know. So, um, yeah, I think it, one of the comments he made was you written the soundtrack of my childhood or something along this. We lines. heard that exact quote uh, so many times I cannot count. I mean, we had so many people told us that exact same thing. And that, that's a statement right there. I mean, yeah. just, yeah. you know, it's one thing to hear it as a compliment from one person. It's another thing to hear it from a hundred people, you know, and it's just like, wow, you know, we, we, we did really did some special work, you know, and uh, it, it makes you feel good about that. You know, it, it keeps, keeps you going. Um, do you have any guilty pleasures music wise? Like, is there a genre of music that uh, you really like, but you know. But don't talk about But don't talk about <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I pretty much put it all out there. I mean, um, if anything, like I get, I get, in, you know, we all have our different moods that we get into. You know, we're in the mood to listen to this today, you know, for some reason. Yeah. And and uh, you know, once in a while, I get in the mood to listen to like throwback, you know, '80s stuff, you know, or uh, you know, some I don't know. I, I listen to some EDM stuff, you know, that's popular today. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think there are some good songs out there, even though, you know, a lot of it could sound repetitive there. You know, if you can pick out the good one, it's like any genre of music, you know, you've got your good stuff and your not so good stuff. One of my guilty pleasures uh, growing up, uh, I was a huge, huge fan of Burt Bacharach. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah and that's that, that's uh, I don't really compose in that style. But whenever I hear the music, I go, oh, that's another Bacharach tune. I just loved it. And it's kind of a poppy, kind of a pop. Uh, he'll do pop tunes with an orchestra, and mm-hmm. and it's kind of soft, you know, soft, uh, soft music, kind of easy listening, I guess, is what you better better describe it. Sure. But, uh, but um, that's that's kind of my guilty pleasure is is that composer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else uh, that's that's kind of off the wall that I would listen to. Um, I can't really. I mean, to to me, you know, just listen to everything you know I mean why not you know I mean Mm -hmm. if if you can appreciate a good song for what it is then it doesn't matter what genre it is like I'm not a huge fan overall of say country music or (laughs) even a lot of rap music I think we share that yeah (laughs) you know Um, but I do appreciate a a great country artist or or great quality song you know there's some there's some Garth Brooks songs that I really like or Trish Yearwood songs I like or you know uh, it, but you know, on a song by song basis, you know, it's just well written, you yeah. know, and you can't deny that. So why not appreciate it? Um, you know, there's there's some rap songs that I really like that are fun, but there's a lot of it that I don't like either. You know, so you know, you just you, you pick you pick what your taste tells you, you you like and what you think is good. 